as, as a product of uh, <clears throat> the ELS program, uh, you know, and, and now as a chair of the task force in America, you know, this is a topic in an area that's very um, important to me. And, um, and I remember when I was, uh, when I came to this country at the age of seven and I was sitting in these classes, you know, I had a, a Korean American teacher and a Chinese American teacher and, I, and it, was, it was a pretty small class. It was maybe about eight of us. Mm -hmm. and, and we kind of gravitated toward each other, try to speak in each other's languages, right? But I remember this, uh, the Korean and Chinese American teachers, they would make sure that uh, we wouldn't do that and we would, we would you know, practice as much English as possible. But at the same time, like she was, the teachers were in a place where they were able to sympathize and empathize with my family and my plight of where I was in that position. And, and I think in looking back and connecting the dots, uh, those are very important moments for a student uh, like me to not be just taught to the test and told you gotta just memorize the alphabets and, and just regurgitate this. But really, you know, a teacher that cares enough to connect my culture and how it's assimilating to, you know, our community. Um, so by the time that I'm, I'm able to transition out, um, I'm in a better position to actually learn and mm -hmm. not just be behind in the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, one of my main concerns is that when I go back to my district and I visit those schools, it's not just eight or nine students. We're talking about 80 to 90 students waiting in line trying to get these type of services. Um, and the quality, you know, is lacking. And there, we have, we have, and it's not, I'm not blaming you, Commission, I'm not blaming, it's just, there's just so much demand of these services that we're not meeting. And, and I, so I applaud you on your, on your vision and your proposal to really fight for equal opportunity, which really means that kids, no matter when they come to this country, should be not taught to the test, but, but really be part of uh, the curriculum in a meaningful way. Um, how do, what are we doing to, to provide some quality control, to, to, so we can have an honest assessment, you know, every couple of months of how we're doing, you know, and, and if we're falling behind, how do we shift? How do we pivot? So, what kind of quality control measurements do we have in place um, to to measure this very tough area to measure? Well, so so let me say, um, it probably is very different in the fact that certainly our numbers over a period of time have increased. Over the last um, three years, we've gone from approximately 72,000 um, L students up to 87,000. So you have, in a three-year period, a, a substantial increase in the number of students that need these services. Um, what Regulation 154 does is, is give guidelines to our districts to make sure that they are able um, to move through this process of identifying the students and the needs that they have. Um, I, I don't think, and I think one of the things that you mentioned that is extremely important is that connection with family. And, um, and the connection that we have now, um, the, the assembly and the um, budget that went through last year was very, very supportive of connections to families um, with the community schools and the funding that went in. And many of our districts are taking advantage of making sure that the access that they have and the funding that they're using is an expansion to provide those services and connections to our ELL families. It's an absolutely critical thing. Um, if you notice in, our, uh, in the um, slide presentation, we listed the things that we're doing related to support, particularly for districts, and some of the most difficult things they have to do is to connect to the families. So the things that we're doing, um, the um, videos that we do are in multiple languages to talk about what are avail what's available for their students. And then as we're trying to, we have translation services available for districts as, as they have a family that comes in and they don't have anyone that speaks that language that they can access that and be able to talk to the family immediately related to the specific needs of their child and what they're gonna do for them. Those. I don't think we can underestimate the importance of making that connection with family. And then the next section is the whole area of what do we do when that child gets in that classroom and doesn't encourage kids to stay with someone who only speaks their language but rather um, 
if you value the bilingualism in communities across the state, then connecting everyone within that school community and showing the fact that you value that is extremely important. Um, we do think that the um, plans that are coming in from districts help us to see how they are connecting to specific populations of students from any particular country speaking that, the language of that country. And so, you know, you say, um, and this is a pretty daunting number, 200 different languages that are taught in our schools. There are clusters of students, but 200 languages taught. And so the challenge is that not that we can immediately have someone that maybe in your ex experience you had someone that could speak your language teaching in that classroom, but rather that we can have connections to make this as, um, as appropriate as we possibly can for those clusters of students that speak various languages coming into our schools. But I think the important thing is that when they're in that classroom with the teacher, that the strategies that we're using, the respect that we have for different languages is shared as the class is learning together. That's a huge part of this, and that is a very key part of the professional development that we're providing. <laughs>